Hello everyone, today we're going to start talking about engines. Uh, so uh, a few updates on schedule for those of you in the class. Uh, so this is the second to last week of class, so we'll have lectures on engines uh, to this week. Uh, Monday of next week we will have exam 3 review. Wednesday of next week we'll have exam 3. Friday of next week we'll have the final exam review. That's Murray scratching his collar. Murray, cut it out. So, uh, anyway, engines. So, uh, this is a mechanisms class, so I'll try to keep most of the engine conversation to mechanisms, but I have to cover some engine basic type things uh, for the mechanism part to be, you know, to really understand what the mechanisms are and what they do. But essentially, the, the beating heart of an engine is the slider crank or crank slider mechanism. Uh, so, there's a crank, there's connecting rods, and then there's the slider, which is the piston, and that's going to be uh, in some kind of a cylindrical bore and a seal with some kind of rings or some other kind of seal like that. It's going to be rings in almost any application that works. Uh, so we've been doing this one for a long time, right? Over 120 years. Uh, a piston cylinder engine has been around a long time, and it hasn't been really replaced with anything. Uh, we, we still use it, and we're still going to use it for the foreseeable future. There's been some, some other endeavors. Uh, there's been uh, probably the, the one that took on the most was the rotary engine, uh, where you've got kind of a Dorito-shaped thing that wobbles around about an eccentric shaft, uh, hence the name Wobbly Dorito as a, one explanation for the rotary engine. And this is going to be in a, a housing that's going to be sort of bean-shaped, and I'm going to do a terrible job drawing it. Or you've got kind of a bean-shaped housing and you've got a rotor. It's, it's terrible because the shaft is at the center of this thing. Uh, but I can't draw. You guys can Google it. Uh, the rotary engine is, uh, it's got a lot of advantages and it's got a lot more disadvantages. And I, I've owned a vehicle with a rotary engine. I had an RX-8, you know, however many years ago. Uh, and the biggest issues with the rotary engine, I guess there's a lot, but sealing is a big issue. Because sealing here, you've got this edge seal called an apex seal in rotaries. Uh, and that is a sliding seal. And the, the radius that, that it's sliding at, this distance from the center of this thing out to here, is continuously changing. And it's hard to keep that seal alive. You also have edge seals sealing the edges of this thing. So uh, at the basically there's going to be a center rotor section and there'll be plates at the end and then the rotor is going to be inside and have to seal on the edges and it's it's hard to keep these things sealed uh, that that's a big problem uh, you know this kind of engine one of the reasons it's lasted as long as it has is because it seals with these little rings and uh, the rings tension helps keep the seat helps keep the ring in place and sealed um, and it is sliding friction but as long as you have some oil which you get out there's oil going to be at the bottom of this thing um, and as long as you keep those things oiled they they live a very long time as in hundreds of thousands of miles a long time um, and so that's that's one of the reasons why these things are, are still around is because the sealing technology works and can last you know you can keep keep the combustion gases sealed and in the top and the oil sealed in the bottom for several hundred thousand miles. You're not going to do that in a rotary engine. Uh, there's some thermodynamic reasons too why the rotary is not stuck around. Uh, in this, the combustion chamber is shaped, so this will be capped off with a combustion chamber. The piston will come up to the top. In this, the combustion chamber is going to look look down on it. It's going to look something like a circle. There will be a spark plug in the center for a uh, spark ignition engine. Uh, there'll be an injector in the center for a diesel engine, and, and when the flame starts, so in a spark engine, the, the, there's going to be a spark, uh, there'll be a fuel-air mixture, there'll be a flame kernel that's going to grow out radially, and it will hit for this roughly uh, puck-shaped combustion chamber, it's going to grow and grow and grow until it gets to the wall of the cylinder. Uh, and it's going to hit the cylinder wall in all directions at about the same time because it's about the same distance in all directions. So uh, flame front propagation is is um, is very homogeneous in in a radial or a, in a in a piston cylinder engine. Uh, the flame front grows from the center and hits the walls all at the same time. In fact, a circle is the optimal shape for that in 2D. In 3D, it'd be a sphere, but it's really hard to get a spherical combustion chamber in general. And and really, the combustion chamber is really sort of a flattened disc up here with a few bumps depending on what the piston and cylinder head looked like but in general looking down on it it's shaped like a puck the combustion chamber in a rotary engine is shaped like a sheet of paper if i look at the combustion chamber on this it's really long 
fairly narrow and it's very thin. Uh, and so here, if I put one spark plug here, it's not an equal time to each part of the combustion chamber. So the flame front's gonna grow, oops, it's gonna grow and hit this wall first, hit that wall first, what is going on? And then it's gonna have to grow and hit that and it's gotta get into these corners. So it takes a really long time for the flame front to propagate. Uh, and that can cause, cause all sorts of problems. It can cause unburnt fuel and air mixture, which unburnt gas is going to kill power. It's going to kill fuel economy. It's going to kill emissions. It's bad. Uh, and it, it some ways limits max RPM, but that's not really a practical limitation in, in road regions. They usually have fairly high RPM. Uh, but it's not, it's not an efficient way to, to burn the fuel air mixture. So what you'll see on a lot of rotaries is two spark plugs as, as one way of solving that problem. Uh, the Mazda rotaries usually have two spark plugs. Uh, at least the one in my, my car, an RX-8, had two spark plugs per, per rotor. Uh, six total spark plugs in a, sorry, four, four spark plugs in a two rotor engine. It was a two rotor engine. Uh, and another issue with this is thermodynamics. So if you think about surface area to volume, uh, for a disc, it's not bad as far as mostly 2D shapes go. Uh, for a thin circular plate like this, it's like the worst case scenario for, for heat transfer. So what that means is, is more of your heat is going to transfer from your combustion chamber to the walls of the cylinder and out the, through the, the cooling passages of the engine in a rotary engine than in a piston cylinder engine, which makes them less thermodynamically efficient, which makes them make less power, makes them less fuel efficient, uh, and it makes your heating problem your, your cooling problem bigger uh, and it, it, this is a big difference it's a big difference uh, fuel economy in general for rotaries is, is very poor uh, compared to gas engines or uh, piston cylinder engines uh, you know power output you, you get it how you measure power output for displacement is different for rotary engines than, than piston cylinder engines uh, because of you know the, the dynamics of a two rotor rotary engine versus like a four cylinder engine uh, those are roughly equivalent to each other so like a two a two liter displacement piston cylinder engine would you need a one liter displacement uh, rotary engine just because uh, it, it, I have to get into the details of it but essentially it, it, these things they don't they're still a four stroke engine but they make power sort of like a two stroke engine because through a full cycle uh, you get you get a combustion event per per rotor whereas in a four cylinder engine you get a combustion event uh, every other rotation of the crank per, per cylinder. So you end up getting, for the, the displacement of a rotary engine, you end up getting about twice as much power uh, per displacement of a piston cylinder engine. But it's actually a little less than that because of these efficiency issues. So, uh, But sealing, from a mechanics perspective, sealing is the big thing. And that's honestly the answer to almost all the questions of why isn't this engine used? Why don't we use some random engine you see on the internet that seems like a great invention? Why don't we use it? Because it doesn't seal. Uh, and it, that engine doesn't, doesn't last. It doesn't live 200,000 miles like we need engines to, to live nowadays. So, uh, and honestly, we've got this thing dialed in pretty well. I don't see it going away anytime soon. You know, maybe we switch to turbines at some point. But honestly, we're probably going to switch to electric before we ever switch to any kind of mechanism different than that. So uh, that's why all that crank slider stuff we've covered in class has been, been so useful is because we, we use it in engines in addition to all sorts of other mechanisms. So uh, there'll be a crank, there'll be a connecting rod, there'll be pistons, uh, there'll be ceiling rings. You know, there's other mechanisms, there's cam mechanisms. Uh, so just like the piston cylinder mechanism is the dominant way of uh, you know, moving pistons up and down and getting air into and out of engine, the pumping mechanism, the dominant way of getting the valves opening and closing to control how much air goes in and out, it's gonna be with camshafts and poppet valves, uh, again. Boy, my dogs are being extra loud today, sorry. Uh, so camshafts are what we use to, to open and close the valves. Uh, again, there's other mechanisms to do it. Uh, none of them have survived the test of time. Uh, and again, just like the crank slider, we're going to be stuck with cams as long as we're stuck with internal combustion engines. Yes, there's some stuff on using little electro-hydraulic or electro-pneumatic actuators to open and close these valves directly. Uh, it's not made its way into any passenger cars that I'm aware of. Koenigsegg's got some company free valve that they're working 
with or bought, I can't remember, to, to get this to be commercially released, some, some direct valve actuation technology. I will believe it when one of these engines has lasted in a, like a Toyota Camry or whatever for 200,000 miles. Uh, that's when I will believe that technology is, is mature because it's got to it's got to last a really long time and it, you know 200,000 miles that's billions of cycles uh, and that that's a hard thing to do you know getting something to last a million cycles is hard getting it to last billions of cycles that's a whole other other thing uh, so this works this this it, it, I don't know why it works I mean honestly the fact that these things last as long as they do cam systems the fact that that works is pretty amazing to me uh, but it does, and it works because we spent 100 years making it work uh, and investigated a lot of other alternatives, and we come back to this, it works. So we take a cam, we rotate it. There's lots of different ways to get the, the movement of the cam to the valve. Uh, this is one such where we use these little roller finger followers. We have a hydraulic lash adjuster. We've got a little roller rocker here that sits on a pivot. Uh, sorry, this would be the pivot over here. This is the, the fulcrum. Uh, the cam rotates, pushes this roller down, and that pushes the valve open. Right? That's one way of doing it uh, that, that works quite well, actually. So that's why we talk about cams. Is they're still used, they're still going to be used. Uh, belts and chains and stuff in engine, there's going to be some kind of a synchronization mechanism between the crank and the camshaft. In a four-stroke engine, the camshaft needs to be spinning half as fast as the crank because each cylinder acts every other revolution of the crank. Uh, so you need them spinning half as fast. You need some kind of synchronizing synchronizing way of doing that. Uh, you can use belts, you can use chains, you can use gears. They're, they're all used. Chains probably the most common. Uh, chains are reliable and will last for the life of the engine. They might stretch a little bit uh, and that might cause some power and fuel economy and, and emissions issues. Uh, but but it, they work and they don't they don't usually break. Uh, in fact, it's very rare for them to break unless you have abused the engine in some way or let it run without oil, which usually something else dies first. Uh, belts, timing belts, do the same thing. Uh, they don't stretch. Uh, downside of belts is they will fail at some point in time, and it's usually less than the life of the engine by quite a bit. You know, thirty to 60,000 miles, something like that. Belts need to be replaced, and it's kind of a booger to replace these things sometimes. Uh, so that would be the downside. Belts are you know, about as efficient. They're quiet. Uh, and they, they don't stretch so that they maintain their timing a little bit better than chains uh, but they do need to be replaced gears are probably the most reliable way of doing it also the most expensive and the noisiest way of doing it uh, but gears don't ever as long as they're lubricated they don't ever wear out in this application they, they don't fail and unless unless you do bad things to them they don't fail uh, and they don't ever lose their timing right they, they're gears they have to be seriously deformed for any timing situations to happen uh so gears are the most reliable way of doing it by far uh but also the most expensive so in some big diesel engines you'll see you'll see gear gear drivetrains but it's usually belts or chains or chains being probably most common and uh i would prefer you know if i was buying an engine i would prefer you know if i can't get it with gears i would probably prefer chains over belts since you, you just don't you don't have to maintain them as as much and the risks if so, of failure are lower but belt belts are still pretty common uh you know you've got the serpentine drive on the front of the engine too it's going to power the front end accessories uh, like the alternator like the water pump maybe the fan maybe a supercharger in this case uh, that's usually a, uh, a serpentine belt which is a kind of a V belt that's got lots of little V sections on it that's a terrible drawing but it's sort of like a lot of V belts all in parallel on one of the same belt uh, that's pretty common you used to see V belts in older applications serpentines can pass more torque because there's more contact area they require a tensioner though uh, and then you can you can put an idler on the back side of this thing, uh, which which is nice. You can route these things. Serpentine, they, they can route them all over the place to the front of an engine and grab all the different things, the power steering pump, all, all the five or six different things in the front of the engine that need to be driven, uh, whereas it's harder to do with V-belts. It's something you, you can do with serpentine belts. Uh, they make some timing belts for superchargers for really high power application. You'll see timing belts, but it'll just be for the supercharger. It will, usually won't be for the rest of the front end accessory drive. Uh, maybe some gears, 
here so and superchargers like you can see here inside this thing there's two straight cut spur gears that drive it uh, that's where the noise comes from uh, and superchargers uh, these kind of belt driven superchargers like that if they make a lot of noise at higher speed that's most of that noise is from the gear whining it's not from the actual air being compressed you can make these things helical and they'd be really quiet uh, they don't do that because people like the noise and associate it with this particular kind of supercharger. Uh, but that's really gear wine is, is most of that noise. Uh, thermodynamic cycles, uh, again, that's a little outside the context of this class, but some of it matters for the mechanic side of things. Uh, Four-stroke auto cycle engines, the uh, gas engines, spark ignition engines. Uh, we're going to have two full revolutions of the crank. So our cycle for timing and everything for a cam diagram is going to be 720 degrees for an auto cycle. Intake stroke, piston goes down, pulls air in. We need our, from again for mechanics, we need to get our cam phased so that it opens to let air in. Compression, we need our cam to get close to the valve, we need our piston to go up and compress the air. Power, we need some way of lighting this mixture off, which in an auto cycle we're going to have a spark that lights the fuel air mixture. Again, the fuel is already going to be in the air when it comes into the cylinder in most cases. Uh, you see a lot of direct injection engines nowadays where there's actually an injector here that squirts some fuel in too. Uh, and it might run some fuel from outside the cylinder, for some from in the cylinder, uh, or exclusively one or the other. You can actually change it between being direct or change it to port in some engines. Some engines it's only direct injection, some engines it's only port injection. There's a mix of all sorts of different things out there nowadays. But either way, I need a spark plug to light the air fuel mixture. Uh, it burns, pushes the piston down. I need the exhaust valve to open and get the exhaust out of this thing. Uh, so I need to have this mechanism work and be reliable, and I need to have it synchronized to the cam mechanism that's opening and closing the valves. Uh, clerk cycle, which is a two-stroke cycle. We do all this stuff in one up and down of the piston. Uh, a lot of those run without valves. In this case, there wouldn't be cams at all. I use the piston as a valve. Uh, so in this case, uh, it's kind of hard to start somewhere on this. So we'll start with the combustion event. So spark plug lights off a compressed air fuel mixture, pushes the piston down. The piston's going to come past a port here. The pressure of the gases is going to push that out through the, the, out to the exhaust. Uh, piston's going to continue down. Once it gets down here, the, once the skirt of the piston gets past these ports here, uh, it actually is going to compress the air in the crankcase. So there'll be a reed valve, a one-way valve, that's going to, as the piston goes down, it's going to compress the air in the crankcase, and that's going to push it around to the top into the combustion chamber. So it uses the piston going down as a pump to push air into the combustion chamber. Uh, then the piston's going to come up, it's going to seal the ports, compress the air in the combustion chamber, uh, and then it'll ignite and go, go again. Uh, and likewise, when the piston's going up and, and closes off these ports here, it's going to pull a vacuum on the combustion chamber, sorry, on the crankcase. This valve will open and allow air in. This will be a reed valve type engine. Uh, these are real common in small, like, implement engines, like chainsaws and uh, weed eaters, things like that. You'll see these reed valve engines. Some dirt bikes and things like that will use reed valve engines. Uh, two strokes are, are nice because you get essentially two times as many bangs per minute, which means you get almost twice as much power uh, for the same amount of displacement, same amount of size of components. Uh, they sound really cool because you do get twice as many bangs per minute. We'll talk about sound in, in a later lecture. Uh, the downside of them is you almost always are going to get some unburnt fuel out the exhaust. Just because you've got this fuel and air coming in here, you've got this exhaust port here, they're going to be open at the same time, and you can't guarantee that all of the air and fuel stays in the cylinder. So you usually get some unburnt fuel in the exhaust, which hurts your emissions, it hurts your efficiency, uh, it hurts your power. Uh, they get hot. There's a lot of power, and you get a lot of heat out of these things to keep them keep them alive. Uh, you don't have a lot of control on the timing of the intake and exhaust, uh, so you can't do any kind of variable timing tricks like you can do on a cam style engine. They do make two-stroke engines with valves. A lot of the diesel two-strokes will have valves, but then you need to have a camshaft and, and all that. The nice thing about this is it's really, really simple. 
makes a lot of power for a really light engine. They're phasing these out mainly for an emissions reason. All that unburnt fuel in the exhaust is, is not good for the environment. Uh, so you see the, a lot of these being replaced with four strokes nowadays and will probably continue to happen in the future. Uh, diesel cycle, um, similar to the auto cycle. Uh, main difference is we're just pumping air into the cylinder. We're compressing the air. We're compressing it so much that it gets hot enough that when I squirt a fuel in there, a fuel that's really easy to, to get to, to auto ignite, I squirt that fuel into the hot air and it just immediately starts burning. Uh, the difference in this is you don't have a kernel of flame that grows to the full combustion chamber like in a gas engine. Uh, you are squirting fuel in here and your combustion occurs at the frontier between the fuel droplets and the air. Uh, that means it's, it's harder to get complete combustion. Uh, and it also means that you usually can't put as much... That's right. You really don't get as complete and thorough a combustion in a diesel, and the fuel takes a little longer to burn, which limits your max RPM. It's one of the reasons why diesel RPMs are as low as they lower compared to gas engines. So I'll have a table with that later on. Uh, the upside of diesel is since here you're just compressing air, you can just continue to compress it until you know really as high as there's really not the upper limit would be the smallest you can make this combustion chamber in here and the, the power required to turn this thing over and start it. So you can have compression ratios, which is the volume uh, when the piston's at the bottom in the combustion chamber, all this volume compared to the volume when the piston's up at the top. Uh, that's the compression ratio. So for diesels, it might be 20 to one or higher. For gas engines, if you start pushing past 11 or 12 to one on modern gas, uh, this fuel air mixture, if you compress it to a certain, if you compress it more at some point in time, it's going to get hotter and it will auto ignite. And uh, these engines are not designed for surviving auto ignition because you don't know when it's going to ignite. You don't know the timing of it. So you might be trying to compress an explosion. You might have multiple flame kernels that grow into each other and get little, little like, knocking or pinging. Uh, you might get hot spots that cause the uh, components to melt or, or fracture. Uh, these engines do not like it when they auto ignite so uh, knocking or pinging pre-ignition those things are, are bad in a gas engine that's a limiting factor on compression ratio in diesels you can have a lot of compression ratio you know, 20 to 1 or more uh, and in thermodynamics you learn that that makes more more power more efficiency you're you're using your fuel more efficiently if you are compressing the air their fuel mixture more if you have your air compressed more uh, you, you get more a more efficient cycle. It's back to the, the, the cycle efficiency in thermodynamics. So higher compression ratio means higher efficiency. And it, it's sort of, there's a limit to, or not a limit, but you're, at some point in time, more compression ratio, the gains are really slight and it, it's harder to practically do. So there's, there's sort of a limit on practical com compression ratio. Uh, but, you know, the difference in 12 to 1 and 20 to 1, it's a big difference in efficiency. It might go from 30% cycle efficiency to 40% cycle efficiency. So that's one of the huge improvements in fuel economy on diesels. Uh, another improvement in fuel economy on a gas engine, you need some way of limiting how much air and fuel get in. Uh, the air you limit with a throttle valve somewhere upstream from here. When that throttle valve is partially closed, the piston is pulling down and it's pulling a vacuum. Uh, and it requires power to try to pull air through that, that restriction. And that's an, just a pure efficiency loss in a gas engine is the pumping across the, uh, the closed intake th throttle. Uh, in a diesel engine, there's usually no throttle valve here. And you usually pull a full amount of air into the cylinder each time. Uh, and since you don't need a very specific fuel air ratio mix like you do with the gas engine here You got to be very close to the stoichiometric, stoichiometric ratio uh, You know somewhere around the 11 to 14 to 1 depending on what you're trying to do uh, you know, Somewhere in that window is the this fuel air ratio has to be that in order for it to burn uh, With a diesel since you're basically burning right at the edge of the droplets. You only need a local fuel air mixture that's close to stoichiometric and that happens right at the boundary of the air the compressed air in the cylinder and the, the fuel uh, right at the frontier of the fuel droplets and the air in the cylinder you've got close to that and, and it'll burn uh, but your overall ratio might be very lean you might have very little fuel to the total air in here but it'll still burn because again you're burning at the, the frontier of the droplet and the air that's in the cylinder until the droplets been all, all burnt so you can learn these things really lean too uh, so you have no, you don't need the throttle 
kind of got off on a tangent there. You don't need the throttle, so you don't have the pumping losses. Uh, you can run these things really lean, which might have some advantages too. And you don't have you don't have to worry about you, you can you can get by with no throttle because you can run really lean. That's where I was going. Uh, so no throttle, higher compression ratio. They're more efficient. They're, they're more efficient. They make more power. Uh, as, as a result for a given amount of, of displacement, assuming the engine speed isn't a factor. That's one of the downsides of diesels is you're limited by your burn time that limits your RPM and that might limit your power you can produce uh, with a diesel. Uh, natural uh, induction, so or basically no supercharger or turbocharger. Diesel to gas, gas is almost always going to make more power for displacement because they can spin faster. And as long as your engine can breathe, spinning it faster will make more power usually. So uh, with diesels, you're limited in max power by how fast you can spin the engine. Torque-wise, the diesel is going to be higher for, for displacement almost always. When you start putting turbochargers into the mix, uh, you can get a lot of power out of diesel. Still, power per displacement on a turbocharged engine isn't going to be radically different than a gas engine in most cases. Because uh, you're still limited by RPM. Uh, in general, the diesels for the same size will be about half as half, spend about half as fast on RPM and make about half as much power uh, when it's when it's not forced induction. Uh, but the efficiency will be higher. So you know, in trucking applications like semi trucks, they'll use diesels because the fuel efficiency is much much higher in that application. Uh, and then they'll use big turbocharged engines. A big turbocharged gas engine would make the same amount of torque or more than a then about, about the same amount or a little less, I guess, because of efficiency. Uh, turbocharged gas engine will make a lot of power and make a lot of torque, but it won't it won't live as long, uh, and you'll have to spin it a lot higher RPM, and it will be less reliable and less efficient. So, in almost all applications where you care about efficiency, diesel is going to going to be the winner. Uh, as far as power goes, you can make power with diesel, you can make power with gas. Uh, but when it comes to, to efficiency, diesel is just fundamentally better for, for two, at least two big reasons. Uh, they do make two-stroke diesel engines. Uh, two-stroke diesels will require some kind of a compressor to get air into the cylinder. Uh, you're probably not going to use reed valves on these. I guess you could, but probably not going to. You're going to use some kind of a compressor, a positive displacement compressor like this root-style blower to push air into the cylinder uh, and then use a poppet valve to control the exhaust. A lot of really big marine diesels are two-stroke diesels like this. Why? They're very, very efficient. Uh, you see some semi-truck engines, like the old Detroit diesel two-strokes, were, were similar to this this as, as well. But very, very efficient. Uh, very A lot of power for size of the engine because it's, it's a two-stroke. So uh, these, are, these are really really nice. Diesel two-strokes are, are really, really good, powerful, fuel-efficient engines. They're fairly complicated, though, because you have to have this, this supercharger. Uh, gas pressure. So when the piston's going down on a four-stroke engine, the pressure is negative. You're pulling a vacuum in the cylinder, uh, and you're pulling against it, so the work done's negative. Uh, compression. Uh, for a while, the vacuum's going to pull the piston up. Uh, but at some point in time, you're going to be pushing and compressing the air, and you got to put work into this thing. During the power stroke, the piston's going to be going down. Pressure's positive, so you're, you're getting work there. Uh, on exhaust, you're going to be pushing air at a pressure out, so you're going to be doing needing work there. So essentially, from here, so for this portion of the cycle, for this portion of the cycle, and this portion of the cycle, you need work. For this portion, you're getting work. So essentially for three out of four of these these cycles, four of the strokes, you need work, but you're only getting work on one. Uh, what that means from a dynamics perspective, mechanics perspective, is you need a place to store energy to get this thing to go through a full cycle. And that gets back to flywheel sizing. We only talked about flywheel sizing from the perspective of um, storing energy for for uh, reducing vibrations and the torque required and uh, the, the shaking torque. We didn't really talk about it in keeping an engine alive and running. So your flywheel might actually need to be even bigger than what we calculated just to get this thing around through the compression stroke and get it running. And there's going to be some minimum RPM where, where an engine will run uh, with, with, a, with, some standard, with a reasonable sized flywheel. It's going to limit how, how slow an engine can run. 
Okay, so that's just about 30 minutes, uh, and I've got plenty of time, so I think I'll probably stop for now. So just a little bit of an introduction on engines. Uh, we'll get into engine kinematics in the next lecture, uh, and then we'll, we'll get into a little more on sound on Friday's lecture. So I'll go ahead and stop it for today. Uh, so that's it. Thank you.